Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Decolonizing Gender. In this uh, short workshop series, we hope to bring awareness to the aspects of gender identity and expression that have been erased via systems of colonialism. And in that way, we also hope to hold space for you and your unique identity and expression and to empower you to do just that out in public with your families and spaces that you feel challenged within that identity. Thank you for being here today again. And thank you to our sponsors and co-sponsors. Traction, Gender Justice League, Black Trans Task Force Washington, and Utopia. I would like to introduce our facilitator, um, presenter today, Malcolm Shanks, a researcher, writer, organizer, and facilitator. They have, oh, sorry, <laughs> they, they, they hail from Washington, DC. Um, they've done a lot of work, a lot of beautiful work um, in political education, building strong movements, resilient groups, and connected people. Malcolm has been involved in political organizing education for more than a dozen years. So we're very grateful to have them here today to present this. We're very grateful to do this work with them and to collaborate on this work as well. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce you to Malcolm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Ganesha. Thank you so much to Traction and Utopia for having me. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to come and stream live to you all. I appreciate the, I have gratitude for so much, including your patience uh, with the technical difficulties. We are behind the scenes. So many amazing, brilliant people are working really, really hard uh, to bring this uh, live stream in this series to you all. So I'm going to, without further ado, get uh, started. I'm going to, um, you know, test out this main thing, sharing my screen. So this is another hurdle of our technical kind of thing today. So bear with me. Excellent. So it looks like we are where we need to be here. So again, I'm really grateful to you all for joining me. This presentation, this workshop is called Decolonizing Gender. Uh, I am Malcolm Shanks. I use they them pronouns. I'll introduce myself a little bit more later. But first, I wanted to ground us with a land acknowledgement, and then we will get into uh, some more of the groundings for today. So it is necessary uh, for us to, for me to name, that there is no way to talk about any kind of exploitation or oppression without naming that the material basis for that oppression is the theft of indigenous homelands on Turtle Island, which is what uh, a few many indigenous groups on the continent of North America call this continent, Turtle Island. Without that uh, the colonial relationship between the United States government and Canada and Mexico and other states and indigenous peoples, the material relationship would not be possible to build oppression and exploitation on. And so in that way, a, a land acknowledgement is an opportunity to acknowledge the ongoing colonial relationship and the fact that decolonizing the land and giving land back and returning land to native people is part of the journey of decolonizing gender that uh, I will be talking a little bit about tonight and that I'm sure many of you have also been interested in and thinking about, right? It's also true that a land acknowledgement first and foremost is an indigenous practice of opening the space by giving gratitude to the relations that hold us. Um, I'm not personally an indigenous person, uh, however, or I don't identify as indigenous, and indigenous people have also made the request in this area of the world that those of us who are not indigenous also share in the practice of land acknowledgement in order to, first of all, 
also uh, give thanks in relationship to the land and uh, the ways that it makes it possible for us and me specifically to be here, but also as a demonstration and an act of solidarity with indigenous peoples as acknowledging both the, the power of the land, the power of its and the centrality of its relationship to us in the way that it allows us to exist and to be here, and also to acknowledge the fact that uh, part of our political journey and part of my political journey is ending the colonial relationship to heal the relations between me and the land, and uh, especially to uh, aid in the return of land that can be healed by its indigenous stewards. So with that spirit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the land that I'm specifically on, which is Lenape land. Uh, this, I'm coming to you from uh, Brooklyn, New York, which is a colonial name. Brooklyn is in city, another colonial name. Brooklyn is actually Dutch, uh, the original inhabitants of this area and the indigenous inhabitants of this area refer to themselves as Lenape, Lenape, the Lenape Nation. Specifically, this area that I'm in is the lands of the Canarsie and the Rockaway Lenape. The, I'm in the northern part of what's called Lenape Hoking, which is in the land of, which means in the land of the original peoples. Lenape just means original peoples in the dialects of Lenape. And this area actually has a really strong uh, biodiversity because of the Hudson River, another colonial name. Its original name is Mahikantuk, which is Lenape for the river of many waters or the river that flows multiple, that flows two ways. That's because it actually is where the Atlantic and that river meet. And so there's fresh water and sea and uh, ocean water from the Atlantic coming to meet in one place. So there are uh, many varieties of birds, many varieties of fish, many uh, plants and other relatives coming through that area. And so it created a situation in which the Lenape stewarded agricultural forests in this area, fisheries, and also maintained uh, a central role in diplomacy and trade routes that came throughout this area using both their travel along the coast and inland routes like what is now Broadway in New York City. Broadway used to be a Lenape trade route that was very, very important in uh, the indigenous history of this continent. And so what is true is that even before European settlers arrived in this area, thousands of years into the history of the Lenape, there was an immense infrastructure that connected the entire continent culturally, politically, economically, and environmentally. And that is the reason that the Dutch and then English colonizers and settlers thought it was so important to occupy and uh, assume control of this area of the world because it was a major center and entry point into uh, the river systems and the, and the five freshwater seas of the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence Bay, and also the powerful confederacy of the Haudenosaunee. And that is one of the reasons that even today, the area of New York City or Lenape Hoking continues to uh, one of the largest holds one of the largest populations and communities of indigenous people on Turtle Island is because of that legacy of interconnection that was stewarded and cared for by the Lenape. And the Lenape nation was displaced several times throughout Turtle Island. And so there is a, a diaspora across the continent in places like Ontario, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Oklahoma, all coincidentally indigenous names, but Lenape people are rematriating to this area of Turtle Island uh, very recently and with uh, some really beautiful and inspiring kind of resurgence. For the first time in about 150 years, there was a powwow in the lower area of Manhattan and also for the first time in about 300 years, the specific species of corn that the Lenape grow, 
say sapping or black corn is growing on the island of Manahata. And so those are all things that suggest that the resilience of the Lenape and their rematriation is both a lesson and a root for us in terms of what makes our resistance possible, what makes my resistance possible as a black person on this continent and what makes our resistance possible as people against colonialism. And so I'm deeply, deeply inspired by the words of Joy Harjo who is a Muscogee Creek poet and the native poet laureate of the United States. She wrote, we are still America. We know the rumors of our demise. We spit them out. They die soon. I really love the energy of that. It really seems to speak to the indebtedness that I have to the resilience of uh, the Lenape people, of the Lenape nation, and of Lenape organizers. So thank you for um, listening to that. Uh, I always like to say that the land acknowledgement definitely should not end uh, when you are stop when we stop talking about the land that we're specifically on. And so there will that we will be continue this conversation and continue this theme throughout the rest of this talk. So let me just continue forward. I'm going to let uh, someone. Indigenous actually sort of frame up what we're going to be talking about and what I'm going to be talking about. And so I'm just going to make sure that the sound and everything work. And then we will watch this video together for a minute. Greeting you in Ojibwe, as you probably gathered, a language from this Oma'a king here. And I'm uh, thanking you very much for the honor of being here. I'm telling you I'm from White Earth up north, my reservation. I'm calling you my relatives. I, I wanted to start like that because I thought about uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, which is that Food for us comes from our relatives, whether they have wings or fins or roots. And indeed, that is how we consider food. Food has a culture, it has history, it has stories, it has relationships that tie us to our food. Food is more than something you just buy at the store, something that just doesn't have a stamp on it. In our community, we are told long time ago by our prophets, our Anishinaabe people lived on the eastern seaboard. And uh, we were related to those people out there, the Wampanoags and others. And we were instructed by our prophets that we should follow a shell which appeared in the sky. And in following that shell, we would arrive at the place where the food grows upon the water. And that food that grows upon the water is manomen, or wild rice. So we were instructed by the Creator to move here. Oma'a came to this place. And our wild rice, our manomen, is our most sacred food. It is the food that is first food given to a child when they can eat solid. It is last food before you pass into the spirit world. As for all our, our feasts and all our ceremonies, it is very important to us. And we, we, as you know, we fought hard and long to keep our rice and to, and to keep it good. This is a, a picture of uh, Nakomas and Nana Buju, that's uh, our spirit beings from who we descend, uh, making wild rice. And this is my community today. Do pretty much the same thing as we did for a thousand years. We got an aluminum canoe now instead of a birch bark. Hard to get trees that size these days. But uh, we still rice. And then the month that is called Manomenike Gizes, wild rice making moon, August into September, You'll see our people go out on the lakes. And we feel a great joy when we go out there with our two sticks in a canoe, go out there and harvest the rice. Sometimes it's uh, tall or short or fat or skinny or looks like a bottle brush or looks all punked out. It's diverse. And that's how uh, we, we can keep it. Because when a wind comes through, it blows off some of the rice. It doesn't blow off other rice. There's great diversity you know, in that. We still parch it the same way over a fire. You can dance on your rice and your new moccasins. 
and do pretty much the same thing for all these years. And that defines us as Anishinaabeg people. Our story of our relationship. That was Winona LaDuc, who is, who is an Anishinaabe organizer, was a candidate for vice president of the Green Party, uh, a cannabis farmer and environmental activist and a feminist advocate for uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls really appreciated her words there because they frame up so much of, I think, what this presentation is. It's not really a project of taking on any responsibility for decolonizing gender at all. It's simply acknowledging the reality of our world and offering a different way for us to be thinking about this than the mainstream conversation offers for thinking about transgender people, gender variant people, those of us who are gender creative. What if, just as she said, as a matter of fact, it's the diversity of the human species that makes us resilient as it does many of our relatives, that trans people are not an abomination or new or any sort of uh, aberration or abnormality or even inconvenience, but in fact are a necessity for the long-term survival of the species because it's our diversity that offers us resilience as a planet and all of our and to all of our relatives. And it's the many ways of life that come with all those different ways of being, being shaped, choosing to be, doing things that actually offer our life ways the sustainability that they need to continue on multiple generations into the future. That's the point of uh, this whole next few minutes. So my name is Malcolm Shanks. Uh, I use they and he pronouns interchangeably. Uh, I'm a Taurus sun sign for those who care. I am uh, really, gr I'm feeling really, really grateful to be here. I have been doing this specific workshop for about five years now, so I'm really excited as well to be able to offer it in this forum. It definitely is a little bit harder virtually where I can't really see your faces or connect with you in the same ways, but I'm hoping that the, the spirit of connection will continue to uh, move between us and that uh, hopefully as well, you can uh, just shout out in the chat if you're here and with us so that we can get some feeling of sharing back and forth, really appreciate it. So if you wanna shout out uh, where you're here from, especially if you're aware of the native and indigenous land that you're occupying, would love as well if you could go and shout out those groups. So let's move forward. Thanks everybody. This talk comes from a really simple idea, which is that we need to turn over our ideas of history, of society, of the world in order to be able to acknowledge some of the realities that have been hidden from us by colonialism that, have, that colonialism has tried to erase either through genocide or, or the genocide of stigma or the paper genocide of law. There are so many ways. Um, as a matter of fact, there are even ways that we come to learn about the world itself that are shaped by colonialism. An example is on the screen in front of us, the, this map that is of the globe. I came across it because I was searching at one point for a map in which Africa was the right size and where we were oriented towards the Southern hemisphere, the South because I've never seen a map like that. And it also, when I saw this map, made me realize that I had never seen a map where the Pacific Ocean wasn't cut into. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought about Pacific Islander organizers who talk about, and indigenous organizers from the Pacific who have talked about how colonialism thinks of and, and, and encourages us to think of the Pacific as a remote place at the edge of the earth, that's far away from everything um, that is disconnected from one another. When the reality and history that is sometimes revealed 
when we are able to look at and rethink our maps is a, a history of interconnection between indigenous peoples and Pacific Islanders across the Pacific um, that gave us things like taro and the potato and navigation by the stars all across the Pacific from Aotearoa in what's, co what's colonially called New Zealand to Australia, to the Philippines, to Kwakwakawak land in uh, unceded Kwakwakawak Kwakwakawak land in uh, the colonial state of Canada, down all the way to taro and potato sharing cultures in the Andes Mountains. So there is an entire continuum of interconnected peoples and cultures that have been sharing crops and food and cult and 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 politics for for centuries and millennia before co colonialism came and attempted to divide up land. And I and the idea that you could sell people with their land in order to you know more effectively manage them for colonialism. These kinds of borders fix us in place, but can't actually stop us from migrating uh, forever. They can't actually stop us from being the full complex people that we are. And they certainly couldn't and can't stop Pacific Islanders from. Uh, traveling between islands, visiting their relatives, visiting their cousins, and making sure that their culture was also passed um, between different peoples. And so this is the kind of uh, stuff that we're up against, is, is an actual erasure of colonialism and what it can do. And it makes me think of uh, Marcia P. Johnson <laughs> and her quotation that history just isn't something inevitable that it's actually a uh, cumulative realities by which it means by which uh, she means that it adds up over time even through the impulsive choices that people make the everyday sudden choices to you know throw a brick at a cop like stormy de la Barre, or to resist and choose choose to fight back against uh police exploitation like all the people at stonewall did that's one of many moments as we're about to see in history when people said no to the exploitation and the hypocrisy that had been imposed on them by colonialism, but not only, but also the gender binary. So for one of the ways that we're going to be talking and having this conversation is through uh, what I call, and other people have called a race and framework. I did not invent it, <laughs> cannot lay claim to that at all. It comes from a really long line of thinking and activism by Black women. What I love about this frame, one of the things is that it centralizes race explicitly for us without focusing on it exclusively. We get to talk about our complexities as human beings while also naming that race is a central way that we live our lives, especially in the racist United States. It allows a clear and a nuanced analysis of domination and exploitation, with and we get to find out where the weak points are in these systems and its interconnecting points and joints. We get to break down some of these false conflicts so that we no longer are competing over crumbs of what a true American is, of what a good immigrant is, over what a real woman or a real man is, or uh, a good worker. But instead, we use the fullness of our experience to look at each other's experiences, use some empathy, and start to draw some patterns with which we can uh, form, which that forms the basis of our coalition work and our and our solidarity and mutual aid with one another. And we also, my favorite part of it is that it allows us to consider the fact that we are full complex people, um, especially in the case of black people, indigenous people and people of color. So one of the more most, especially recently, uh, famous people in this legacy of uh, race and is the person who coined the term intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw. This is her picture over on the right. She's actually one of also one of the inventors of critical race theory. And so she and her, the organization that she founded, the African American Policy Forum, have been on have been going on the defensive and the offensive recently because of all the laws around the country that are being passed to stop what's being called critical race theory, which she did technically invent, but which she actually doesn't, the things that they're trying to outlaw are just um, 
any sort of critical thought about the United States, about our society, about race, about why things are the way they are, about the class structure. And she is one of the main people who's been drawing our attention to the fact that laws and policies are not neutral, but in fact hold the biases and bigotries and uh, economic interests of exploitation and oppression that directly have impacted Black women across centuries since uh, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. However, she was not necessarily the first person to actually talk about the idea that race and gender or the experiences of being black and a woman or a worker um, complicated one another and needed to be uh, thought about from the perspective of those specific people in or who had their own views of society and their own political visions. And so I wanted to name some of that to bring in some of those other ancestors, some of those other elders who enable that uh, analysis to be here today and to be what it is. One of them is Sojourner Truth, who in 1851 was attending a women's rights convention and was frankly pissed off by the sexist, misogynist myths about women that were being used to excuse them not having a vote or them not being able to vote in society at that point. And some of them, some of those excuses and myths were about the inherent weakness of women, about their dependence on husbands or men in their lives, uh, things that supposedly made them not ideal voters. Sojourner Truth rightfully pointed out, well, that doesn't actually make a sense given how I have lived my life, how she lived her life as a black woman, as, as an enslaved black woman, meant that she, no one ever treated her like she was weaker than a man. As a matter of fact, the entire economy depended on her being, not only being able to, but being forced to work just as hard as, if not harder than the enslaved black men around her. And it also, and also no one ever treated her as if she was dainty or deserving of protection simply because she was a woman. As a matter of fact, the fact that she was a woman and an enslaved woman meant that actually she was able to be exploited in ways that the people around her might not have been able to because of their gender. Um, the, the phrase was, the, the, you know, and so the phrase that she used uh, was, aren't I a woman? Am I not a woman? Is this, is, this, is this really the category that you all are creating? Because if so, it does not seem to include me. Ida B. Wells was another person who pointed out the hypocrisies and contradictions in the category, in the gender uh, moral system of the US apartheid regime at that point that was uh, Jim Crow. And what she was pointing out was that there was a major hypocrisy at the center of lynch mob society that claimed to care about the sexual purity and chastity of white women so much that it would protect them at all costs against sexual violence. But at the same time, that same system depended on constant sexual violence against black women in order to create the terror that that maintained the color line under US apartheid. And so she rightfully pointed out the hypocrisy of white men and all men who claim to care about rape and sexual assault when in fact it was the very foundation of their power in society. And, the, and, and she pointed it out as the foundation of racial white supremacist power in the United States. Claudia Jones, was a communist uh, black feminist it, who was born in Trinidad. So we can see also this isn't just a US lineage. There are women, there are black women who are coming from all around the hemisphere whose experience experiences of colonialism are leading to their understanding of the world and their politics and their vision for society. She was eventually deported by the United States in 1955 for being a communist. Um, and at her trial, one of the things that she said was that it wasn't 
the experience, it wasn't the communist party that radicalized her. It was her experience of being a colonized woman, a black woman, uh, a black working woman in society that actually radicalized her against a, against the structures that sought to keep her at the bottom of society, that sought to keep her and her community and her people and other peoples underneath uh, an oppressive hierarchy. Frances Beale said a very, very similar thing, but she said it from the perspective of the US Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the US South. She wrote one of the earliest uh, Black women's manifestos to be published in the 20th century. The Combahee River Collective is, is, is pretty famous in, in Black feminist circles, at least, uh, for coming to also understand the complexity of what it means to say we support workers. The majority of workers in the world were not unionized white men like a lot of leftists in the United States were acting. And in fact, at the point that the Combahee River Collective was organizing and today, the majority of exploited workers in the world are women of color and continue to be women of color, which is not a category without race, a category without sex, and most certainly not a category of folks who are unimpacted by sexual uh, violence and the violence of colonialism and capitalism. And so they rightfully pointed out that all these things are connected because the lives that people really live um, are impacted by all of these things. And Angela Davis literally wrote a book called Women in Capitalism, <laughs> where she was talking where she was talking about the uh, objective qualities of the oppression of black women in America. And so she named it, she named that the oppression of black women is inextricably tied to capitalism because of some of the same dynamics that this other legacy and this other and this lineage of other women are naming. And so I don't want to, we don't have to get too academic or into the theory of what they're saying to understand the pattern here, which is that uh, these, which is that these women and many women uh, were organizing against the society that they were in uh, because it oppressed them as black people, as black women, but it oppressed them through a gender hierarchy that was that is transphobic, that is the same hierarchy that we can think of as the gender binary. Uh, here's a story that actually illustrates some of that. This is a, from Sojourner Truth's life. This is in 1858. She was speaking at an anti-slavery rally and someone accused her of the very common trans misogynist accusation uh, that she was disguised in her own clothing and that by expressing who she was and by being herself, she was somehow deceptive, untrustworthy, um, and therefore could not be, could not actually be an expert on her own liberation. And therefore also supposedly that that meant that slavery wasn't that bad either and that she shouldn't be speaking about it, right? And when she demanded to know why this man would make this accusation against her, it was, and he said it was because her voice was too strong. Her voice could not possibly be that of a woman. So it was the force of her rejection of slavery that actually caused this guy to think of her as gender nonconforming. That's that pushed her outside the realm of what he thought a real woman or proper woman should be. Though, as we said earlier, as an enslaved black woman, Sojourner Truth had forever been outside the category of what most white men considered uh, the average or normal woman to be, because the normal woman was not supposed was supposed to be indoors inside the patriarchal household, and enslaved women were required to move either between households or be outside the household in order to produce value and money for slave society, right? And so these gender norms that Sojourner Truth was was supposedly stepping outside of were not politically or racially neutral. They were in fact the status quo of slavery. The gender norms or the Western gender norms, in this case, we could say that she was supposedly rebelling against and that she, I would say 
she might even agree that she was rebelling against were actually white men's expectations for conformity to status quo. His expectation was that a good woman would be satisfied with her status as an enslaved person, that a good woman would choose not to fight against slavery, that a good woman would choose not to question the oppressive uh, situations that she saw around her and in which she found herself. And she's not the only one. Women like Sojourner Truth were not fighting or struggling to be white women or to be equal to white women. They were fighting to free black women and black people from all oppression. And as part of that project, they constantly and frequently criticized all of the hypocrisies and contradictions that they saw in the moral order, which was focused on and centered around white gender norms and categories. What white middle-class settlers were doing in this place or in another place, and then they would change what they were doing and then switch up society's rules to say that they were still the norm, even though they had changed their minds day by day. This, the contradictions that come from this are really, really clear when we look at places like France, where if you are a Muslim woman and choose to cover your face because that is part of your religious practice, that is banned by law. But if you are walk, if you walk into, for example, a drugstore or a pharmacy or a hospital and do not have your face covered, that is also illegal. So you must have your face covered, but you cannot have your face covered because you are Muslim. You can only have it covered because COVID. That is uh, just reveals the contradictions and hypocrisies of Islamophobia in France as it specifically impacts women or people or hijabis. And also there's the example of Castor Semenya, the Olympic runner. Uh, the Olympic, the International Olympic Committee actually decided for the first time in its history to ask science to define what a woman or a female was in order to in order that she would stop uh, winning her category so badly because a lot of women uh, a lot of other women were saying that it was supposedly unfair uh, that she was competing against them when they didn't actually know anything about her besides what they saw so all they could use was the racist assumptions about black women and about black femininity that 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 sojourner truth that ida b wells and that other women were also fighting against so the question here is does this binary that is set up by colonialism actually even serve black people black women or is it harmful is it actually one of the ways that our people have been exploited and oppressed? Uh, Tony K. Bambara seems to um, also have some ambivalence or be like wondering what is up with the realities of whether this actually is to our benefit or not trying to aspire to manhood or trying to aspire to womanhood. And so in 1969, she wrote that we actually might need to submerge all these easy common sense definitions until some realistic definitions come through the struggle and commitment to black liberation. And so uh, cis black feminists in the 1960s and 1950s and 1860s and 1930s are taking issue with the gender categories that have been offered to them by society under the understanding that the sa that same society is creating gender categories for them at the bottom of a racial hierarchy and at the at the uh, center uh, in terms of oppression of a colonial order meant to oppress them and exploit them. And so these are the facts that we need to uh, establish about the gender critique <laughs> that we have about the gender resistance and the legacy of gender resistance that we inherit. It is, it is uh, just as much part of the resistance to colonialism and the resistance to enslavement and the resistance to capitalism as it is uh, the resistance to the gender binary because all of those things are intimately connected. There are some facts to establish before we move forward. There is no such thing as uh, male genes or female hormones or a male body in fact, there is an entire universe of different 
uh, embodiments and body shapes and decisions that we make about our bodies and what we do to our bodies and how we use them and how we shape them that create different combinations that cannot be reduced to one of two for our entire lives. Intersex people are uh, an example of this kind of erasure that happens in our society because uh, one fact to establish is that intersex people are just as common as people with green eyes or red hair. One, another way that we could put it is that there are more intersex people in the world than there are people in the country of Mexico. And that's not to say that, uh, that's not to be flippant or to make a joke. Uh, Mexico is extremely important and central to world history, and so are intersex people as more than 1.7% of the population. The reason that intersex people are treated as rare or abnormal is because of ableism and patriarchy. Ableism uh, in this specific context being the idea that our bodies are supposed to reproduce sexually heterosexually, monogamously, um, on command, <laughs> and that to not do that means that you are broken, that you are missing something, that you lack something, or that you are um, criminal in some way, right? And patriarchy is what says that, the, that what we are supposed to be able to do is reproduced sexually and heterosexually. In this case, um, to be penetrated or to penetrate um, during the act of sex, right? Which is uh, totally ridiculous, uh, but also causes doctors to this day to engage in harmful, mutilating, non-consensual surgeries against infants and children all over the world under the idea that they are uh, fixing their bodies so that they can fit into this one of two your entire life system. That is a, a special kind of violence considering that intersex people are as old as the human species because they are one of the manifestations of humanity and that transgender people are also as old as the human species. That they, that even though we haven't been using that word or using that, uh, using that idea to organize ourselves forever, that in fact there has all there have always been more than man and woman in our uh, in our societies, and so transphobia is more than a moral failure, uh, us just being mean to one another or not being used to something that's new or being behind the times. In fact, it's a structure of society, like white supremacy, like colonialism. It does something to aid in the exploitation and the division of people. That, f that creates more and more wealth for fewer and fewer people and dehumanizes some of us so that it normalizes the idea that we don't actually deserve to share in the abundance that this earth actually holds. And so it begs the question for us of how the world even got two genders in the first place. It, we have to ask the question, how did the, how did the entire world supposedly get the same number when it came to the diversity of the human species? And there are only a few things that have impacted the entire world in the past few uh, decades and centuries. And one of the major ones is colonialism and imperialism. This in front of us on the screen is a map of countries that have been under European control, i.e. that means colonized or occupied or invaded by Europe. And then this map is of every country that has ever been attacked, invaded, or occupied by the United States. Which shows us that um, beyond Europe, that the United States actually is also just on its own the inheritor and holder of an imperial project that spans the entire globe. And we can see the same erasure of the Pacific on this map itself, because if we saw more of the Pacific on this map, there'd probably be a lot more red in places like Hawaii, the US Marshall Islands, Samoa, etc. And so I want to uh, do a
quick kind of reflection for you all. We're not going to do it as a because of the format of tonight. But still, if you're tuning in with us, this is a moment to, to think about how concretely imperialism has shaped our lives at the level of our clothing. So what I would like for us to do for this activity is to just take a moment to look at a tag in your clothing. I think I have one right here. This is, this is yes, this top. So you can look at the clothing tag and what I'd like for you to do is just to look at the country where it is made and think about which world region that is in. Think about whether the people in that country have a lot of political power over determining their own wages, the conditions in which they make those clo that clothing of the prices that it gets sold for and therefore of how much they make of so many things. In fact, um, once again, it is women of color who are overwhelmingly uh, exploited by the clothing industry worldwide and also through some of those same things that we were just talking about, through that mixture of patriarchy and colonialism. And so imperialism very much has a concrete impact on us in our everyday lives, even though it is usually thought of as just about um, economic or political affairs of nations or armies, but it's also about then how the practices of trying to control a people from far away or from a position that's not uh, democratic or uh, of the people or in a, in a healthy relationship with those people is all, requires so much control over how they think, how they dress, what they do, where they go, who they have sex with, how they think about their bodies and their sexuality. And so of course, the gender norms and expectations would be impacted and changed and shifted by race and empire. I once uh, went to a lecture by a Nigerian feminist. She might be mad that I called her a feminist, but whatever. <laughs> so she was telling this amazing story where she was talking about how many Yoruba men, uh, that's just uh, that's an ethnic group in West Africa, um, mostly in Nigeria, would constantly at, tell her that the feminism that she was espousing or the ideas of women's power that she was naming were unnatural or untraditional or not indigenous to West Africa because in West Africa, men are traditionally, quote, supposed to wear the pants. And her response to them was, and when did you start wearing pants? As a historical fact, pants are not indigenous in the way that we wear them today to West Africa. And so that means that even the very thing that they're attaching their manhood to is a Western import. It is a colonial imposition, the very gender category and gender expectations that they are trying to hold themselves to, which speaks a lot to some of the misunderstandings and homophobia and transphobia that continue to exist all around the world because we continue to be in a colonial world order. It is very difficult to get outside of that period um, unless we are specifically working against it in our organizing work and everything that we do. And so this is another um, time to just name some of the facts about world history. I call this non-binary people are not new, an extended remix. So starting from the very creation of the world and how indigenous peoples around the world have thought about the creation of the world, there is more than just man and woman. This picture at the top is a uh, illustration of Mawulisa, who is the creator, one of the creator deities of the Fon people, of uh, Benin, of Togo, of Ghana, and a few other places in West Africa. The Fon people are, mo that's F-O-N. They're, they're most famous for uh, giving vodun to the world. Uh, and uh, which is also called voodoo and uh, vodou and a few other things as well, candomblé uh, and, and spiritual traditions throughout Haiti and Brazil and Cuba 
and the, and the Dominican Republic and the United States. Mawulisa is oftentimes depicted as part man, part woman, um, and also the duality of the sun and the moon, uh, but is also constantly, um, they're depicted together as one body. The same thing is true in South Asia for the deity Adha Narishwar. And that's on the, in this stone picture, the stone uh, figure that's on the bottom left here, that actually is a combination or composite of two deities, Shiva and uh, Shakti. Shakti represents the power of divine femininity and Shiva is her consort. And they're oftentimes depicted together to represent the chaos and complementarity of fertility and creation. That is also true, that same idea is also true in central Mexico and in the Valley of Mexico. This uh, black and white drawing on the lower right hand side is of the creator deity of the, one of the creator deities of the Aztecs or the Nahuac people. In the Florentine Codex, which is uh, one of the main ways that a lot of um, pieces of Aztec philosophy and spirituality have been uh, written and passed down. Ometeo, who is the creator deity, is oftentimes represented as having two heads and having uh, one body with two spirits, um, which uh, represent masculinity and femininity, but also duality, which is thought of to be something that is uh, produces the chaos of creation or is also referred to as Nepantla, the in-between place from which creation springs in the, in the Aztec uh, philosophy. And then we also have from very recent history as well, <laughs> um, Europeans traveling around the world and when they established first contact, they even couldn't help themselves from noting and noticing and writing about the gender diversity that they saw. This is an example from uh, the southeast of Turtle Island, actually, from Cherokee land, Catawba land, and Gualey land. The Spanish tried to invade that area of what's uh, colonially called the United States in the 1500s and were run out by a coalition of indigenous people. But during that time, they actually met what might now, people who might now refer to themselves as two-spirit, possibly, but certainly they, they were asking the questions, why is this, why is this person dressed up like basically a, a, a man in a dress? You know, the phrase that comes again, a man in a dress, a man in a dress. And, and what's interesting is that the cacique, which is what the Spanish called all the uh, chiefs or head people of the villages, said that the indigenous person, that that person was their family. I don't think they actually said that's my brother. I think they probably said that person is kin to me. That person is part of us, are part of our community. Italian monks in Central Africa in the 1600s also couldn't help but notice the gender diversity. This is a drawing done by Giovanni Antonio Cavazzi, who was in the court of Queen Njinga of Angola in the 1660s. This person in this image here is a Kimbanda. Kimbanda were not only spiritual advisors, but were also political advisors, which is uh, one of the reasons that they were in many of the courts of places like Congo and Matamba and Angola at the time that the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Italians and the Dutch arrived in that area in the 1600s. And that what is uh, also true is that they were uh, many chiefs of that area would not go to war or make any uh, important political decisions without consulting Kimbanda in that area. And the, there's a, Braz, a Brazilian Portuguese word, uh, chibado, that is a slur used often towards trans people that actually finds its origin in the word Kimbanda, which is uh, in the indigenous languages of that area means medicine person. And then in South Asia, I apologize, there's actually a, um, I meant to add another word here, but kinnar, which is uh, an, um, 
much more appropriate word uh, for hijra, which people start to think have started to refer to as a little bit um, offensive or outdated, is a gender group in South Asia. And, and the British in the, in the late 1800s tried to legislate them out of existence uh, in the British Criminal Tribes Act, along with many indigenous and uh, Dalit Bahujan people. And so this history of them, of the British, of British colonialism trying to eradicate or m m make impossible the lives of trans people, uh, or let's say non-binary people, trans might be an imposition, non-binary people or uh, gender variant people, was intimately linked with the laws that they were also passing to criminalize indigenous people and to uh, solidify the caste system so that Dalit Bahujan people would also remain at the bottom of society even when the British had taken over from uh, Brahmins in terms of who ran colonial society at that point in India. And so there are just examples and examples and examples. Someone, someone in, the, in the chat is saying it's wild that people could think that trans and non-binary are new concepts when there are so many examples from history. Absolutely. The reason is that actually we, going back to that whole thing that it's a structure, not a moral failure, there is a history of violent suppression and erasure that has actually made it difficult, if not uh, very almost impossible, to actually maintain the memory, the ancestral memory, and the connection and the cultural survival that would help people understand that trans and non-binary people are not new. Whenever colonizers arrived in places, they violently suppressed any ways of being that they didn't like or, were, or that were inconvenient to the hierarchical society that they were trying to create. Oftentimes, the first people to be impacted by this violence were people who didn't match the European understandings of binary gender expression. We have to acknowledge that the center of the transphobic colonial order that we are talking about that has erased this history is warfare and it is warfare against indigenous people. In 1513, one of the earliest incidences recorded of violence against people because they were not men or women happened, happened during the rampage of Vasco Nunez de Balboa through the Isthmus of Panama. Panam uh, Balboa has tons of parks named at parks and parks named after him and statues of him all over the Americas because he supposedly was the first European to see the Pacific Ocean from the Americas. Uh, on his trip through the Isthmus, when he first made that trip, he actually came across the village of Quarequa and had murdered the king and about 150 of his war warriors outside the village before he even entered. When he entered, he saw that many of the courtiers and villagers were dressed in ways that he thought was inappropriate or stepping outside the boundaries of binary uh, cisgender. And so he ordered that those people uh, be thrown to be torn to pieces by dogs, be murdered in this really horrifying, violent way. And this was reported all throughout Europe, from Spain to the Netherlands to England, as a heroic act of Christianity. And so there was a, a prominent book that was written to tell people in Europe about the early exploits of the conquistadores that actually uh, had a, an illustration of this exact scene of Balboa murdering all of these people. I have it here uh, just as a trigger warning. It's very upsetting and uh, pretty violent imagery, but it's also one of the most famous images of anti-indigenous violence from the conquistadores. What's interesting is that people rarely talk about the fact that this is also an instance of transphobic violence. And one of the first moments that this order of transphobic violence is immediately connected to the war against indigenous people and their cultural ways and their cultural values and their histories. 
gender expression was also legislated and stratified and hierarchized, hierarchized um, and segregated racially in colonial societies, including and especially in uh, the societies where chattel slavery was practiced and, pe and women of African descent were around. There is a story from New Orleans uh, from the late 1700s where the Spanish go governor actually outlawed women of African descent leaving their homes with their hair unwrapped. And the reason that he did this was because many Spanish and French Euro women of European descent came to him and uh, were talking to him about the women of African descent basically getting too much attention, i.e. Uh, money <laughs> and um, resources and even therefore political power and economic power from white men around them because supposedly um, they were too beautiful when having their hair unwrapped. And so uh, the reality though is that there's the creativity of gender and that's just the reality. And so black women wrapped their hair in uh, tignons in scarves. The laws were actually called a tignon law because women women of African descent were required to wear a tignon or a scarf whenever they left the house around their hair. And so black women just started to, and women of African descent generally, just started to put jewels and um, necklaces and other feathers and other kinds of decorations into their scarves along with wrapping them in more and more elaborate ways until the scarves themselves became a notable fashion statement of the era. At the same time as some people were being told, you're not good enough to be a woman and therefore can't be outside as a woman in the same way as everyone else, certain other people were being forcibly um, kidnapped from their people and forced into the categories and cultures and habits of European middle-class womanhood under the guise of quote unquote, civilizing them. And so uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas uh, experienced in in the in the order of uh, tens of thousands um, children kidnapped and forced to assimilate into European standards of manhood and womanhood, which was the stated goal of the military officers who invented the Indian residential school system in North America. And I think I, I have to stop here and just. Um, mentioned that there are that a, a couple of the deep impacts that we are seeing of this legacy today one of them is the is the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls all over turtle island that uh, con colonial states like canada and the us and mexico are constantly erasing and choosing not to investigate but also there are the mass graves that are being discovered in British Columbia and Saskatchewan of children, of, of dozens and hundreds of children um, in mass graves that were kidnapped from their families and were tortured and held in, in these conditions in order to commit cultural genocide against people. And it is the it is that that process of creating men and women actually is the process of genocide. We would not have the two genders that we have if not for the massive genocidal project of eliminating and eradicating people who offer alternatives in our society. That is uh, exemplified in the life of Vittoria who was an enslaved African person who in the 1500s, who was kidnapped from Benin or what's now Benin and taken to Portugal. And when she arrived in Portugal, she quickly decided and refused to accept any of the clothing that was offered to her by her supposed owner and because it, he was offering her the clothing of a, a, an enslaved man or an enslaved African man. And so what she did instead was dress herself how she wanted to in a waistcoat 
with a vest and a head wrap and she started a business as a sex worker that was so popular that she operated it both in the capital of Lisbon and in a, a set of islands, the Azores, hundreds of miles across, uh, into the Atlantic. She often had lines of people around the block who were waiting to visit or have sex or uh, get advice from her. And so in that way, she came to the attention of the Portuguese Catholic Inquisition. They undressed her at her trial to see if she had the body of what they considered a cis woman to be. And when she did not, they uh, accused her of witchcraft and cross-dressing and imprisoned her for the rest of her life. And this is one of the earliest cases of the criminalization of gender nonconformity um, that we can see. Um, and again, colonialism, again, Christianity and colonialism in this Christianity and colonialism working hand in hand because those residential schools that we were talking about were also operated by the Catholic church or the Episcopalian church or the uh, Lutheran church. This colonial order, I keep naming that, um, because that's what it is, continues to impact us to this day where indigenous people still are not allowed to wear their hair how they like, are still not allowed to dress how they like, do what they like with their bodies, understand uh, their bodies within the cultures that they were born in, within the indigenous cultures of this land. And so we can refer to that as the imposition of Western standards for what gender norms look like and the criminalization, demonization, and ridicule of all other kinds of bodies and ways of adorning, moving, or using them. I sometimes call this the colonial gender binary, a way uh, the colonial order that imposes two kinds of being um, and on the rest of us imposes a non-humanity, a criminality, a ridiculousness, and certainly a marginal existence outside of um, outside of the formal economy, outside of the loving embraces of our families and our faiths, et cetera. In spite of that, there are so many people who have resisted and rebelled and chosen to live their best lives. We just heard a, we just heard stories of a few of them, Vittoria, the women who wrap their heads in tignons, uh, to resist the, the dehumanization. It is 1049, so at this point, I feel like it's a good moment to keep us going so that we can get to a good amount of time for a Q&A. I'm gonna to try to get us to a 20 minute Q&A here so we can get some good time. People who refuse to be confined by this colonial order, they chose to find freedom beyond the social rules of race and gender that were being imposed through this genocide. And in some cases, they even worked to make sure that other people shared in that liberation as well. Eleno de Cespedes is or was uh, a technically a mixed race, but mm, that might not apply. <laughs> part Spanish, part African, or part Moorish person in the mid to late 1500s who lived as both a man and a woman throughout their life and also married both men and women throughout his life. Uh, when Eleno had the choice of what to wear and wasn't being um, controlled by the Catholic Church as well, he chose to live his life uh, using he, him pronouns and as Eleno, as a man. And so, uh, but again, the Catholic Church and doctors as well caught up with him after he had lived, I think, a good 30 to 40 years as a, a good 30 years as a surgeon, as a nurse, as, an, as a barber. And they forced him to uh, dress as dress in dresses and petticoats and other types of Spanish colonial women's clothing of the time um, until the time of his death. But uh, he still managed to, you know, have a pretty significant love life and be another jet-setting entrepreneur in the meantime. So I think that's worth celebrating. 
Mary Jones is another person worth celebrating. She was born and raised in New Orleans or in Louisiana, and then came to New York where among other things, she worked as a sex worker and pickpocket. And that's how she came to the attention of the New York police authorities who, uh, you know, put her on trial multiple times and sent her away to prison multiple times. I think one of the most uh, beautiful things about her life is that she said uh, and talked about the support that she had in the community that she came from in New Orleans, that actually the women around her were part of her community and saw her as one of them and um, maybe didn't think that it was totally normal, but most certainly didn't reject her or her life. And this is a still from uh, Rowan Amon playing Mary Jones in the recent movie by Tourmaline Salacia in 2019. I think it's important that we highlight when uh, trans folks are rewriting these stories so that we don't have to see the propaganda that's been given to us by a, a cis genocidal order, but instead um, the beautiful depictions that we can create for ourselves. Frances Thompson was the first black woman to testify before Congress, and she did so in the 1880s, I believe. She did. Uh, she organized black women to go to testify before Congress after there was a race massacre against uh, recently freed black people in Memphis in the 1880s. And uh, many of the black women in Memphis experienced extraordinary sexual violence during that massacre. And she organized black women to go to DC to testify before Congress in order to uh, convince them that reconstruction needed to be defended by the national army. When her status was discovered, uh, her trans status was, dis was discovered or um, coercively revealed later in her life, it was used as a way to undermine not only her credibility, but the credibility of all the Black women and Black people who had testified about the violence and the sexual violence that they experienced during Reconstruction. William Dorsey Swan is one of the grandmothers of ballroom in the United States. Uh, she was born right before uh, slavery ended around my hometown actually in uh, Piscataway, uh, Nanticoke territory in what's uh, colonially known as Maryland in the Eastern shore and then moved to Washington DC and founded uh, ballroom houses and held parties out of her home in Washington DC and came to the attention of national authorities, sociologists, um, uh, doctors who wanted to fix her and to fix society by fixing her. Dr. Charles Hamilton Hughes said that she was uh, creating a and maintaining an organization of color Dorado paths. Dr. Irving C. Ross said that they were a band of Negro men with androgynous characteristics. And my favorite is by the U.S. Attorney General A. A. Bernie, who said his evil example in the community must have been most corrupting. I think that is goals. And clearly, William Dorsey Swan is one of the most brilliant organizers of the late 19th century. <laughs> and that is uh, proven by the fact that when they, uh, Miss Dorsey Swan was arrested, actually, uh, I believe for cross-dressing. Dozens of people wrote to the President of the United States, Bro Grover Cleveland, in 1896 to get them a pardon. I think that is so significant that there was so, that a time when that at a time when cross-dressing, homosexuality, and sex work were all illegal, including things like race mixing, drinking from the wrong water fountain, all of those things could help, you could lose your job, you could be harassed, you could be killed. Dozens of people signed this petition to the President of the United States because they cared so much and thought that this person was so, such an integral central part of their community. And then a uh, bonus is uh, the time that Sylvia Rivera went to the Revolutionary Constitutional Convention in, I believe it was Washington, D.C., the one that she went to. 
and met Huey P. Newton and other members of the Black Panther Party. And so the dreams and visions for decolonizing North America or Turtle Island, decolonizing Southeast Asia from US violence during the 1970s of decolonizing uh, East and Southern Africa from British and from British colonialism and uh, and South African apartheid that those were very much connected to the visions of ending um, anti-gay homophobia and anti-trans uh, violence that Sylvia and Marsha were fighting against. That was that was very much part of the vision that they had as well. This was one. This was actually a very strong coalition in the 1970s, and so I think it it bears talking about like why didn't that yield anything at the moment? It was because of the FBI, because of the CIA, because of the counterintelligence program breaking apart those coalitions, and so in many ways it was the political work of the United States to undermine the anti-colonial struggles of trans and gender non-conforming people as well. As a, a last moment, I love for us to think about and envision an alternative future, that we can do something different, that we can be slightly different. So. I like for us to reflect on these questions for a few minutes. What would your body be like without oppression and exploitation? How would you be shaped? How would you move? What would be a part of you? What things would be a part of you, like your cyborg parts? How would your community treat this body that you have? And finally, how would your body make community? How would you also treat community with your body and how would you make it and connect it? I don't think it's an overstatement to say that many of the people that I've been talking about have already been on a journey and a vision to find answers to these questions outside of the tracks and the trails and the well-beaten paths that homophobia and colonialism and heterosexuality have um, ripped into our earth as borders in order to separate us from one another as humans. They that 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 specific vision and journey that all of these folks are on is exactly why they have been targeted and why our communities are targeted. Um, for ridicule, for criminalization, for extermination, because it is it is because the threat to the colonial order is represented in many ways by the opportunities of stepping outside of the gender binary that has been offered to us as the main choice through which we are able to uh, reproduce the generations that come after us and. There, it's possible that there are ways, and actually not just possible, that there are ways. It is, uh, I think, necessary for us to consider why these and how these struggles can aid one another and be in conversation with one another. The struggle to decolonize our land uh, and our world and to decolonize the forests and the rivers and borders, and also the struggle to decolonize gender, which is one of the more significant borders that has been drawn through the human species in order to facilitate the exploitation of non-men on behalf of men, which we can refer to as patriarchy. And so that is um, the 
overall <laughs> overarching thing um, that I wanted to present and talk about with you all. So now we will move into a Q&A section, hopefully with, we actually have 30 minutes left, so I think we will have a good amount of time for questions. So please go ahead and ask any, if you have them, you can put them in your chat. It looks like we've got people joining us from YouTube, folks joining us from Facebook. So you can go ahead and type your questions in the chat and I will do my best to answer them. So thank you for joining and uh, yeah, let's get started. So it looks like there may be some technical stuff going on. So we may not have as many questions or people able to submit questions as we thought. That is totally fine. We're still getting some chats that are coming in. I appreciate that folks that this is resonating with this, uh, that folks are resonating with this presentation. I am glad, Orion, that you like the questions. I do hope that you get to get some interesting answers when you think about them. Have any questions in the chat? We have one question here. What are my thoughts on why it's more accepted for women to cross-dress than men? Hmm. That's a hard one. Um, I don't know if I even agree with that assessment. I mean, I under I totally understand where it's coming from in terms of the amounts of violence um, that are experienced by trans trans feminine people and by trans femmes in comparison, um, for example, to folks who are supposedly embodying um, or supposedly experiencing less violence because they embody masculinity or other kinds of trans masculinity. But I, I want to uh, zoom out from that question a little bit to question whether that is even true, that it is more accepted. It is, it's possible that they provoke different violent reactions. Um, so, you know, hopefully you're not experiencing this pushback as like intense. Um, but I, I would say that considering the rates of sexual violence and incarceration and suicide among and against uh, trans men and trans masculine people, that there are some uh, maybe under examined, ignored or erased uh, impacts of like the cross-dressing thing um, that actually are about trying to rigorously control people who are supposed to, supposed to be, according to society, in the, in the subordinated or subjugated category of women. And therefore the borders of that are policed in ways that don't necessarily, and maybe aren't as public, publicly violent as attacks on trans women and trans femmes who experience violence uh, in, in public and in private, clearly, but again, different kinds of violence. I think it, it is more acceptable for women to play with silhouette and fashion and different things like that because supposedly the stakes are not as high for patriarchy. <laughs> um, I think that that I think that that's as far as I might go in terms of thinking about like the supposed acceptance and the differences, you know, because I don't want to I don't want to overstate anything because everybody's experiencing an immense amount of, of violence and a lack of acceptance from my perspective at this moment. I hope that's <laughs> a helpful response. We have another question, where do we go from here knowing what we are up against? I'm really thankful because there are people who are already doing this, this from here work. I, um, there are many, many people who are doing the work of uh, spiritually reconnecting the lineage between some of these um, categories of people that I was talking about who used to have different responsibilities and roles in society as spiritual and political advisors. Some people are going from the perspective of spiritually reconnecting those legacies and those lineages. Some people are going from the perspective of politically organizing against the legal structures of transphobia, whether they are the dis discriminatory laws or the discriminatory practices that are protected by law um, I would say where we go from here is land back, 
giving land back if there is no way that we would be able to maintain the same system of transphobia if the settler colonial state of the United States were not in control of the land. And so I, I think it's always necessary to end how we started by naming that one of the major ways to undermine the oppressive hierarchies that we experience is by undermining the material basis of that hierarchy, which is the theft of indigenous land and the continued occupation and exploitation of the people on that land. And also enjoy pride. <laughs> That's a good way to also go from here. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> You're right, Brad. There's so much. There's a lot to relearn in this. Um, it's definitely a long, 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 lifelong journey. I think I've been really, really inspired by the fact uh, that I have so many friends and elders who have made this immensely courageous decision to live in an embodied way into their values of open-endedness by pursuing a life, uh, a body <laughs> even, right, that doesn't take easy answers. So I think that if we are at a good time, there is no reason for me to just keep talking just to make sure that folks can put in some chat. So I think we are going to recuperate some of our time and hopefully give it to part two of this, which will be, I believe, in a, a week or two. We're doing a part two to this presentation, which will be a panel of organizers and activists, mostly uh, indigenous, gender variant, non-binary and trans people will be talking to each other about colonialism, uh, decolonizing gender, uh, how uh, Two-Spirit and other um, indigenous categories of gender variants are, uh, can be leaders in healing our relationship to each other and land. And uh, we'll also be talking about whether gender even deserves to be decolonized or whether it's one of a few different oppressive institutions that we will inevitably leave behind as we give land back and decolonize our other relationships. So I will, I do really hope that you'll join us. There's a, there it is on our screen. Um, part two on July 8th at 6.30 PM Pacific. So I do hope you'll join us. Thank you so much and enjoy, uh, thank you again to the amazing interpret interpreters for tonight. Really, really appreciate your labor and your work and making this accessible to as many people as possible. Um, I really take to heart that you're there for me because I don't sign <laughs> and not for those and not for other people and deaf and hard of hearing folks. So happy pride to everyone. Thank you again to Traction and Utopia Washington. And uh, we will see you hopefully in two weeks.